Okay, I, I, my name is Tom Suter, and I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And uh, we're happy to have you here today. We've got a, a really great webinar, Evolving Cybersecurity Needs of Teleworkers During COVID-19. And uh, we're gonna have a good day. We, uh, we do this every Thursday after lunch, and we thank you for joining us for, all, for this. And uh, I wanted to welcome all the attendees. Special thanks to Patrick Potter, Laura Tuzelin and Dan Karyanis and the rest of the RSA team. Uh, been a great partner. Uh, and this afternoon, we're looking forward to hearing from our panelists, which will be followed by Q&A. Uh, and uh, we're gonna pop in a poll question or two, then answer your questions. And uh, now I'm going to introduce the panelists. And I apologize for my audio difficulties. My, my computer decided the last second that my fan was gonna burr and whir but I'm gonna to try to just wing this the way it is. But uh, anyway, we have with us Anthony Bailey, Deputy Director of the Cyber Intelligence Directorate uh, at the Office of Intelligence and Counterintelligence at the US Department of Energy. How are you doing today, Anthony? I'm doing quite well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Good. Oh, no problem, no problem, excited to have you. And we also have with us Dr. Ray Latier, uh, Compliance Branch Chief Deputy Compliance Branch Deputy Chief, Cybersecurity and CISO, United States Marine Corps. How are you doing today, Ray? Just fine. Uh, I do apologize for the fact that I don't have a camera because of where I'm located at the moment, but it's really great to be here. Thank you. Right. Well, I'm kind of feeling that myself, so we're going to have to, we'll make it, we'll make it work. Uh, also, we have with us uh, Jonathan Thebus, Chief Information Security Officer from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. How are you doing today, Jonathan? Doing well, thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. And last but not certainly least, we have with us Patrick Potter, who's a risk, risk uh, strategist from RSA. How are you doing today, Patrick? Great, Tom, great to be with everyone today. Thanks for joining us. And, and where are you today? I think you're the, the, the panelist that's outside the area. Yeah, I'm, it's still morning for me. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, where we are experiencing over 35 days of over 110 degrees. I think we broke another record. <laughs> Yikes. Hopefully you're, you're someplace cool. I imagine that you are. Um, I am. Great, great. Well, anyway, um, let's get started. Um, Anthony, uh, it'd be great to get some take, your take on what's going on at the Department of Energy with pandemic. Uh, I know one, one thing that we've had here, this has been an ongoing Everybody's changed the way they do business. We're, we're all working remote. Um, this happened basically overnight, and it's kind of the new normal. But I'd love to get – we hadn't had anybody from Department of Energy. I'd love to get what, what's happening uh, with your group and, and how it's affected cybersecurity in your world. Good. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit broader, not just so specific on Department of Energy. Just a little bit of background on me. I'm, I've been Department of Energy since 2002. But all that time, I've also been a member of the intelligence community. So I'm just coming back from a three-year detail in the community. The interesting thing, it, it all came to an end during this COVID. So that made it very interesting in what does coming back look like. But anyway, um, I am, I, in general, the department is doing pretty okay. I would just say that the department is doing pretty okay. Because you can only see so much. There are only so many people at work. I was struck by a couple of points this summer. Um, one of them was, I don't know if you guys heard this, but at the start of the summer when this COVID lockdown first started happening and, and we started feeling the economic pinch, I remember British Petroleum announced that they were gonna cut their oil production by 40% and invest that funds in clean energy because they wanna be a clean energy company by 2050. I personally thought that was fascinating. I thought it was a significant change happening in the world that we should pay attention to because these guys have been doing this since 1888. Another thing I noticed as, as the summer was going on, and this one was going on since last year, is this case between the state of California versus Uber Technologies. One of the reasons that was so relative to me because I was working this, um, let's call it Fed, Federal Employee 2.0 in the intelligence community. What does the next Fed look like? And one of the points I kept making to different agencies is what's going on in the economy in terms of like that definition of what is a worker, what is an employee, is going to have significant effects on us in the government 
whether we know it or not. We're just not having those conversations yet. So in general, these are some of the things I kept looking at as to how it affected our world, because I'm very much interested in the social side of this computing business that we're in. So on this topic, I didn't even look much at supply chain. In, in good days, supply chain gives us all kinds of challenges. In chaotic times, we expect some of those challenges to be multiplied. However, I, per I personally feel like we should wait for some of this post-COVID analysis to see what the effects were for um, um, supply chain. I know the nefarious characters were still at war. That's expected. What the effect is, I'm not sure yet, because when the whole world comes to a, a pause, other things slow down as well. So I think we need to wait and see how that pans out. But I wanted to look more at that worker and the workforce. And so I kind of looked at things through um, a set of themes and about themes, four themes I'll share with you today. Because I believe that some of these themes are conversation we've been having in the government. We're kind of slowing the government about some of them. But I do believe that when this dust settles and we get back, we can't wait to have some of these conversations because we just have to. This calamitous um, event certainly caught us off guard, right? Um, I was between jobs when I went home and it's just been fascinating to see how we all survived doing this. One of the things I thought about was how do we deal with, um, like say jurisdiction and decision-making? Because I sometimes feel like in the workplace, trying to collaborate well and get the right decision from the right chief that of the 10 chiefs you're working for is oftentimes difficult. So I was curious to see how this was gonna work in the um, COVID times. I ask people this question. I asked people this question before this topic came up and this panel that I knew about came up. And it was interesting feedback. I was right about some of them. Getting used to personalities in this digital world is a fascinating thing that people talked about. It's something that I expect. I jokingly say when I'm having meetings with people I don't know that I'm speaking to a bunch of avatars and when this is over, hopefully it will get better for all of us. But at the end of the day, um, people are finding that, 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 that getting the decision from the right person is just kind of an interesting thing. It's something we have to think about. Um, how workers evaluate supervisors is another interesting th thing I've been thinking about because I know many workers who aren't necessarily fully motivated. And then the question is, if they are at work and they're not motivated, what happens when they go home? The interesting feedback that I got from some people were workers, workers reacted to how their supervisors and managers engaged, especially in this digital world. So if they're doing stuff and feedback is slow, their motivation tends to be slow. The type of work they're looking for, they want managers that are engaged. So I think that's something we, should, we have to look at. Because in general, sometimes I don't think we do a good enough job at that in the workplace today. A second point I looked at was collaboration. We all been talking about Office 365. We talked about many people using Teams. And yes, we have the tools to collaborate. And we feel good about collaborating. But quite frankly, I'm not sure we ever thought through some of how we collaborate. In our trainings, we, we discovered that, you know, if you have routines, things that are recurring on your calendar, it helps with collaboration. But it's also interesting to see what meetings are like that are ad hoc when you can't necessarily find people. As people say, it takes a lot of patience. One thing that threw me off that I, I think we have to think about how we go into this telework in the future and the effect on the personalities at work. I never, this one caught me off guard, but someone pointed out to me that collaboration really involved the, 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 those conversations by the coffee pot, those conversations by the water cooler. When you walk in and, and see, hey, so-and-so, we're gonna have this meeting later. I'm, I was struck by how much collaboration failed when you take that out of the picture. So I think it's something we have to think about, especially when people are working at home and some people are in the office. A third thing I thought, I thought about is accountability. In the um, California versus Uber technologies, really what was a question is what is an employee? If you think about how the gig economy works, people really get paid for what the work they're doing. We live in a whole different model. We get paid for the work that we expect you to do, whether you do it or not. And so I, I've been thinking about how as feds, how are we gonna um, account for our, our employees' work? Today, what we do is we account for them based on they show up. If it's eight hours, they're in the building all day, you know when they showed up and you know when they left. That's accountability. I know some of those people who do two hours work all day, but it's still, they still get paid for it. 
What I think is interesting is as we go into this, how do you expect your workers to perform at home? Um, it's not logging in and logging off at the end of the day. So I think we're gonna to have to figure out how do we deal with this accountability and the workers in this new environment? Because some of it is gonna stay and we're gonna to have to figure out what does that look like? If you work two hours in the office all along and you're working two hours at home now, is that a problem? I'm just throwing it out there as something that we have to think about. I think we'll also run into the issue of equality. In the gig economy where people are doing work and they get paid for what they do, and we come home and let's say you're working half of your year teleworking. Somewhere, someone should ask the question, is it reasonable that you still get to accrue all that sick leave and regular leave when you do have time at home to do stuff? I throw that out there because I think it's gonna strain us a little bit. And if we don't get ahead of it, I think it's gonna kill us. The last um, thing I looked at was infrastructure preparedness. Like you said, we got thrown into this thing. Many people were um, working with tele doing telework already. The knowledge workers, the digital workers, they did okay. But then the I looked at the infrastructure preparedness from home and work. We can talk about work. There's a lot of work things we have to do. But at home, it is 2020. We never ask people, do you have an email? Do you have a cell phone? Do you have a network at home? In an urban area, we expect that you have broadband and it works just fine. And for the most part, it works fine for people. Until we all got tested at doing school and work at the same time. I've spoken to many people who realized, oh, my bandwidth may not be adequate enough for that. But whose challenge is that? One of the questions we could throw out to you is how many of you got some advice from your IT departments as we went home and say, this is what your configuration should look like if you want to produce the way we expect you to produce at work. My guess is if we ask that question, you gotta raise a hand, very few, if any. Again, we got thrown into this and we've never been tested to this level. But as we go back, I bring this up now that says, hey, when we go back, we have to talk about this. Adding just a few more licenses to your infrastructure does not make a user mobility. We have to change the questions when we go back. For example, what access do you need to have to get your work done? And I phrase it that way because I also live in a classified environment. And on that side, we're gonna have some really tough conversations about that. So all in all, that's kind of how, I mean, there are many other ways to look at this animal. I personally think as calamitous as it is, I think it's also fortuitous because a lot of these things we were talking about, we never got far enough on it. Listen, BP made their decision because they do not believe fossil fuel demand will ever get back to pre-COVID level. The world will change. It is changing. We got to brace for it. That's my spiel. <laughs> well, you brought up about six great points. I can't comment <laughs> on every single one of them. I think that, uh, a lot of us have learned a long time ago that if you're a bad employee in the office, you're a bad employee away from the office. And, and if I have to watch you being from right. private industry, uh, that's, it's, that's not really what you want to measure people on. And I actually think that this gives you a new accountability where you, if you're on video, people see you and have to interact. You can't say you're, you know, you're in another meeting, you know, right. everybody can see everybody's schedule. There's a lot more transparency. So, very interesting, Anthony. I'll get to, get to you some questions later. Uh, next up, we'll go with uh, Dr. Latier from the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, I'd love to hear your perspectives. And of course, you know, we're not used to this environment where we have to interface using Zoom and, and Teams. And, and sometimes we don't allow, um, and we, we here at ATARC use Zoom for government, but not everybody has allowed that in, in their systems. And it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a challenge. But uh, but glad to have you on, uh, Ray, and I'd uh, love to hear what, what's going on in the Marine Corps. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, uh, first, I got to compliment uh, a panelist member there, Tony uh, Anthony, for doing such a great job of his, of his analysis. I, I do appreciate um, some of the things that he was looking at it from uh, more of the uh, the social economic perspective, and of course the the human interaction. Like it or not, we all have those same type of uh, aspects that we, we work with. For us in the Marine Corps, it was a very interesting um, approach. Um, uh, naturally, with, uh, with Marine Corps, we tend to be uh, pretty agile, pretty responsive in when it comes to new and unusual things and, uh, and unexpected circumstances. Um, we tend to be very mobile, uh, you know, deployable, um, uh, transporting ourselves to a, a lot of various destinations at a moment's notice. Uh, the difference is, obviously, this is done 
at, at home. Um, and you're right. Um, it was kind of a, an interesting um, perspective as people started to see the impacts of this. Rather than, than letting things fester, as, as you can imagine, because there are a lot of questions that did come up, many of those that, you know, uh, ideas that, that, uh, that Anthony was talking about a little bit ago. Uh, uh, what can I connect? How can I connect? What can I use? What can I use? How do I communicate? Um, we're comfortable, uh, particularly in my, my career field in, with, within the Marine Corps in, in cyber and under uh, the, uh, the CIOs area. So there's communications, computers, and connections. So we, we kind of understand that aspect of the technology of communication. But I thought it was kind of interesting is that um, we, we, we kind of uh, pulled back, took a look at what we could do, and then immediately started communicating out to our workforce. Uh, back in March, we actually put out a MAR admin a Marine Corps administrative message to kind of give everybody a heads up. Look, we know we're going to be doing an isolation. We're not going to be, we're going to be doing quarantining. We're not going to be able to attend or go to the workplaces as we did before. So start working your environment now, reduce your email size, um, start taking a look at uh, what resources we have, such as Outlook web access and other VPN uh, capacities. We turned internally. Are we ready for the network to be able to respond to more of the external workers um, uh, coming in through virtual means as opposed to, again, as Anthony said, everybody being in the office and seeing that you're there. Surprisingly, because of our planned um, network approaches and updates, um, we kind of accidentally fell into success. Um, I, I'd like to be able to say that, oh, yes, we saw this coming and we know what we're doing and <laughs> adjusted the network accordingly. No. Uh, the reality of the situation is, I think, like everybody did, is if you were planning for expansion and you're planning for more of a distributed work environment, you were probably in a better alignment for this uh, than those that had did not. At, so here we are in the Marine Corps. Um, we we saw, like I said, the first more admin went out um, in March saying, prepare, get ready to, uh, make sure you watch the size of your attachments and such. And then in April, we decided to kind of clarify it a little bit more because people were saying, okay, what can I use? Where can I go? What, what can I do if I take my government furnished equipment with me? And so we had to work with them to say, all right, this is what you can do with your GFE. This is what you can't do with it. You, you can't you know connect to your personal printer. Uh, well, what can you do to use? personal VPNs, working from home, uh, uh, what is there uh, for, um, for office, uh, office web access, VPN connections, uh, how can we take it, we even got some discussions of what type of capability you could use for your, your uh, PK enablement using your CAC to log into the system of what type of devices you can and could not use. Again, telling people you want to get this, we can pull it together and, and provide this, this ability for you to continue to communicate. Um, you're right, you, uh, you brought up an excellent point here about the, Tom, about the uh, uh, different communication capabilities. Uh, the, uh, the DOD CIO gave us pretty clear direction on what capabilities we could use right away. Uh, the CVR instance of Teams being one of them, and of course the DOD C, uh, CS being another aspect. Um, we tend to use a lot of, uh, of, the, of the Teams construct within at least the Marine Corps. The Zoom for government and others were out there as uh, uh, an offered capability that I know that the Department of Homeland Security has, has gone through and they've done their assessment on. They did the Fed rep certifications uh, for. Uh, there were just still some issues where certain leadership said, look, let's just keep it simple. We've already invested in these couple things. Let's Let's keep it on uh, that investment construct. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't have other people that have their own preferences. I, I, some people, you know, for uh, training and education and the university, they like Zoom for government because it's better for them, they say, for their classes. But it was, I think, an interesting experience for us to go through and, and, and re-evaluate re what are those tools, sets, and aspects we think we have, both that uh, we have personally and professionally, that can help us enable the communication flow. Uh, I, I'm pleased to say that because of uh, the maybe as our organizational uh, approach, a hierarchy, we didn't have much of the issue of people uh, not finding what they could do or where they could go or who they had to respond to. We pretty much have that, that hierarchy in place. But it, it was a process for about a couple months where we had to work with the supervisors, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the branch chiefs, with the commanders and such, to help them shape what expectations they would have for the work 
product that would come from their um, from their civilian Marines, uniform Marines who are working from a distant location. Now, of course, um, we don't stop being the military entity we are. So, of course, we had things with our, our uniform Marines on bases and such, uh, on um, quarantines with inside of bases, staying within particular locations and such for their time. Um, so we continue, uh, uh, we could continue to be the uh, the force we needed to be. We adjusted, I think, relatively quickly for aspects of uh, social distancing approaches, how we, uh, we're doing training, um, and, and along that line. Uh, I, I'm happy to say that, you know, we've had like about 150,000 uh, people, for the, you know, uh, on and off our network the entire time. Um, we have never had any VPN issues, you know, knock on wood as I hit my head. Um, but we've actually built the infrastructure in such a way that we're robust enough to be able to respond to the needs. Uh, who knows how it's going to work and change in the future? You know, again, like Anthony, I'm not always so sure. Uh, we still have issues where as we're moving things slowly to get back on prem, um, we have certain leaders that have found that, well, I kind of like having this uh, social capability. I want to be able to reach out and see somebody from my office but maybe they're working in more of a, a periods classified uh, perspective. So we have to work out, well, when can you do it? How do you do it? What are the physical steps you have to take to be able to make sure that's simple, repeatable, and measurable? So that if someone does something, they can be sure they don't miss anything, still get the mission done, but at the same time, uh, as I like to say, uh, try to find a way to say yes, but don't be rash. I wanna make sure that we don't fall into that rash approach of uh, inadvertently causing problems or, or, or breaching security. Uh, and Tony, with you, uh, I did over 20 years Intel. I, you know, I, I came for that field, so I, I get what you're coming from in, in so many of the areas there. Oh, yeah. um, so, so as, as we're working through this, I, I just maybe uh, as my point, and, and I'm also gonna have to unfortunately be pinged out of here. I got called by my general a little bit ago. Um, but uh, I, I want to go along by saying that uh, I think it is going to be interesting to see how we do transition our workforce. I, even the commandant is starting to say now that we need to relook at um, how many people do I really need to have uh, in the offices? How many people can I have at satellite locations? Uh, if they need access to classified systems or such, what do we need to, to work kiosks and such so we can take and give them those capabilities, but at the same time too, keep that distributed approach as we need to. Uh, I think it's gonna be f interesting, fascinating to watch as we evolve this over the future. Uh, I, I personally though, I think we're resilient enough and I think we've got enough um, uh, uh, courage enough, if you will, if I can use that word, to kind of face this and really transform what we're doing within uh, the civil government approach and civil service approach. Um, and I think we're going to see some lessons that we can get from our uh, uh, commercial, our uh, defense, uh, our, our uh, and industry partners, brothers and sisters, as what they're doing, and maybe get lessons learned from that. Um, the, the, one of the keys is, uh, last thing I point is, I'm trying to make sure that we don't get caught in what I call the shining object syndrome because I got everybody saying, oh my gosh, I got my new thing. I got to have this new aspect. Provide me the valid mission need. What do you need to do? How do you do it? Can we already provide that for you? Because there, there's going to be costs uh, uh, related to all this. This is going to be some network adjustments. This is going to be some um, uh, reallocating of budgets. And, and just as you know, the DOD budget is not looking good for you know 21 and, and 22. So those are some of the things that I'm working with and 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 worrying about. Uh, I know linked in the supply chain, we're looking at aspects of that too that continue to come up uh, a little bit uh, deeper uh, approaches and quality that we were trying to provide. Uh, we also just sent out a, a MAR admin just recently to remind people of how we take and watch for certain applications that one would use on your uh, mobile phone, but particularly we, we focus on the government furnished mobile phone. We say what we don't do, what we won't allow on a government phone, we do offer recommendations for everybody else to say in your personal device, you might not watch out for these things, but we don't tell people you know, what to do on your personal phone. But we say, this is our approach as we try to take and streamline and standardize what we're doing on what has become a critical enabler of communication in our society, our mobile device and see how where that goes. So I, I will kind of end with that and I stand ready for any questions. And again, thank you so much for having me here. Great, great. Um, how much time do you think you have? <laughs> Hopefully uh, well, I, 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 I can I, ask you a couple if you could, you might want to ask me a couple of questions now because I've got to get ready to go uh, on okay. a super thing in here in a couple of minutes. So, okay. Well, I'll call an audible at the line. I'm a football guy. Uh, do you think that uh, for security post pandemic, what is what changes have you seen from adversaries, if any, 
How did your security posture change when you moved everybody off site? Well, you know, that's a real great question. I, I can't go so much on a lot of the TTPs as you can appreciate, obviously. But I, I think we, yeah. were, we were well positioned in some of our standard policies on uh, the strength of encryption, on the strength of how we take on government furnished devices and how we control and manage them. Uh, if you have your, uh, your, your, your government laptop, uh, we have a, uh, a standard uh, operating system configuration. Uh, the VPN connections are managed and controlled through, you know, uh, type uh, type to encryption, uh, we, we are doing the things to keep it as safe as possible. Uh, I'm not sure if the adversaries so much have been hitting us uh, in the network approaches that way, but like everybody else, we're warning people, watch out for particular email strings that come across, watch out for uh, particular you know, um, uh, friend requests, and oh, be careful if you're getting uh, uh, a request to participate with using other uh, social communication capabilities, that it's really coming from who you think it is, and that if it is, make sure it's protected and uh, layered appropriately. Over. And, and maybe last while we have you here, uh, how has it affected your productivity and collaboration? Kind of alluding to what Anthony was talking about. Is it too early to tell? Is it some tangential evidence that it helps or hurts or? Well, I, I can give you some of my personal experiences that, oh my gosh, we're actually more productive because we're doing more things. I mean, uh, one of the great uh, examples, thing, uh, Anthony, I'll say too, is that you talk about a lot of it is the, how many meetings we go to and really how many meetings are you really productive when you're not at your desk doing something and you're sitting talking. Now, I'm able to do meetings at the same time I could do other work. I can have a, a video discussion or be a participant listening for something as I'm answering or, or doing a particular note. I have found that we're actually doing more work longer, um, particularly those that are in the working environment at home. I've had to tell some of my workers, some of my staff, please shut down five o'clock or whatever. Unless you've got a hot mission, your end of your duty day is in your duty day for crying out loud. But we have yeah. people that just because you get into the pattern, that's what they continue to do. So I've not seen yet any impact I can say from my perspective in the Marine Corps where we've actually lost productivity. Over. Great. Well, I will let you release you with that and that we don't want to get you in any kind of trouble. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see you back sometime. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. Again, I really wish I would have known about this, but this came up last minute. So again, yep, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Happened. Great day. Thank you. Right. Great. Great. Um, so we spent a little extra time with uh, Dr. Lertier. That's just the way it, it rolls. And I'm back in video with my iPad. I got that to work. So you got to be flexible in this environment. Uh, next up, we have Jonathan Phoebus. Uh, I, back to football analogies. Uh, football has been uh, changed around a little bit. One thing is they did cancel preseason games. You actually had a preseason game for COVID. If you can go into uh, some of the things that you've encountered in, in your, your world and, and, and maybe at some point uh, talk a little bit about what you guys did in preparation with COVID. I thought it was a fascinating story. Sure. Um, so our draft year for the current class of player started about two and a half years ago when we started looking at form factor of laptops. At that point, we knew we were going to be doing a refresh to Windows 10. So we started looking at, well, let's consolidate the number of form factor devices we have. Let's get everyone onto a laptop. It'll make it much easier to do a standard load. And everyone's telling us that mobility is, is the watchword. Fast forward to February and COVID is becoming a reality. Fortunately, 99% of our staff all had laptops. Um, on a usual day, we would have maybe 20 to 25% of, um, of our workforce being mobile, coming in through either VPN, VDI, or um, one of our other portals. And we knew we were gonna be coming up to this uh, mandatory telework Time. We weren't sure how long it was going to last. So we thought, boy, this would be a great time to do a couple of test drills. Uh, so we set up in the cafeteria. We uh, blasted communications across the agency and told folks, come on down. We'll walk you through signing on remotely. We'll make sure you have everything that you need for your laptop. If you need a portable PIV card reader, if you need a one-time password token, for bring your own device, we'll make sure you get that then and there. And we started running these clinics for two, three days. And then we had uh, two days of uh, drills. So we told folks to stay at home as much as possible. 
and to sign in remotely. And we started watching what was happening on our VPN and our VDI. And we quickly made an audible and, and called our carrier and, and asked to increase our bandwidth. Uh, so by the time everyone did make it home on, on March 16th, we uh, had bandwidth uh, reallocation well underway. We had uh, a lot fewer calls coming into our CSC. And because we had done those uh, walk-in clinics and because we had done the, uh, the test days, we also knew pretty well what the top five calls we were gonna be getting were. So it was very easy for us to quickly shift those calls over to specialists on the help desk, get them resolved very quickly, and get people up and running. Um, another thing we had been working on over the past couple of years was re retrofitting all of our conference rooms with video conferencing capabilities so that we could use Skype, so that we could use WebEx, and um, we could accommodate folks who were teleworking. Unfortunately, the, um, the user experience in that case was, if you were in the room, it was great. If you were uh, calling in remotely, you heard a lot of crosstalk going on in the, in the conference rooms. So we were a little bit nervous what was gonna happen once people were home. And what we found was it worked a lot better because everyone was calling in through the, through the application. It was much easier to tell when someone was trying to speak. Uh, with the remote hand raising capability in some of these applications, it was much easier to cut down on the crosstalk to get one person at a time working. And after a few weeks of working together, uh, and getting the workflows down, we were able to automate some, some workflows using our Office 365 uh, functionality. We also uh, got people trained to send links instead of complete documents. So it was very easy for folks to bring up the links. They were editing it in real time. They were able to see what was happening uh, as folks were skimming through the presentation or skimming through the uh, the document and we actually had presenters who were saying, I see a lot of people are on page 53 and we'll get to that. Let me just explain this so that you know what's gonna be happening. Um, and we found that being a little bit proactive got us over that major hump. And once we were over the major hump, folks were very into trying to find new ways to become much more adapted to teleworking to the remote access capabilities to the collaboration capabilities to the point now where we're trying to find ways to get people to stop having so many successful meetings and be able to spend a little bit more focus time uh, doing that actual work. Um, we had a number of, of managers that were not into telework. They thought the only way people could be productive is if they're in the building because everyone knows if you're sitting in a chair in the building, you are being very productive, as Anthony said. Um, I think a lot of our managers have realized it's much easier to see how productive people are being to get immediate feedback from these collaboration tools and um, to actually be better, better situated for more productive and happier employees. And the big question we're facing is, gee, this has been working out so well, uh, what's going to happen when we start going back to the building? Am I really going to be expected to get in my car and drive five days a week? Um, so we, we haven't gotten to that point where we finalized those discussions, but we realize that that's going to be coming. Um, we're getting a lot of questions for people about new tools. Hey, um, I see my son is using this in school. My wife is using this at her office. Do we have this capability? And um, our enterprise architecture intake team is doing yeoman's work, looking to make sure we've got those capabilities covered, uh, getting one pagers out there to show people how to quickly, you know, get screen in screen, picture in picture going, or to bring people into conferences in the middle of a workday. Um, we have so many different modalities of uh, being able to work. We have a, a huge and successful bring your own program um, that people are getting a number of capabilities just through their phone and then they log into VPN when they have to be at a big meeting or when they need uh, an application that's not online or uh, available through BYOD because of security concerns, functionality concerns, whatever. Um, so our workforce is pretty much training itself. 
The other thing we noticed is we've cut down a lot on printing. Um, we do not allow people to hook up their own printers. And as we've done our conversion um, in policy from what we called sensitive, unclassified, non-safeguards information, uh, which was our version of controlled, unclassified information, now we're rolling out CUI as a program, it's much easier for us to say, yes, you used to print that when you were in the office, but you could destroy it in the office. Now printing it at home, because of the sensitivity, you need to protect it when you're not working on it. So do you have a place to lock it up? Do you have an appropriate shredder to destroy it? Uh, so this has helped us work enormously to get people to move towards electronic signatures away from wet signatures, yep. except for in specific application or functionality requirements. And um, we think we're also saving some money by not having people print things that then either sit on the printer and never get discovered, or printing and putting them on their desk and forgetting about them. Um, and people seem to be liking that automation. We also started a program where we had a, a warehouse that had several dozen extra monitors. So we started issuing those to people so that instead of working on their small laptop screen, they had a bigger monitor, which made it much easier for them to make the jump away from paper into electronic. We still have some accommodations. We still have some special use cases, but we've made our workforce a lot more productive and flexible than they ever have been before. So that's my Yeah, question. I remember Darren Ash. I don't know if you were there when Darren was there, but he was talking about BYOD and working with the unions. I had him on a panel like six, seven years ago. So a lot of that work that you guys put in before just, just really paid off, sounds like. Because we had that wonderful policy, because we laid that groundwork, you know, six, seven years ago, yep. as you said, it's made it much easier to implement things quickly, to change direction as needed. And we had such a... a, a wonderful success with that, that people are very happy to be working with us and it gives us the flexibility to innovate. Great, great. Uh, that was fantastic. And last and certainly not least, Patrick Potter, it'd be great to get some feedback from you. I know you, you are in a great role where you get to go across federal government, but you also get to go across uh, other industries like financial, like healthcare. It'd be great to get your, your perspectives you've seen since March. Yeah, great. That's a, that's a great setup because that's exactly what, uh, what I'm going to do. I want to give you that private uh, sector perspective a little bit just to add to what has, has been said. And just to, to get into that, you know, the, this, this whole term workforce and workforce risk has meant different things to different people. You know, as we've talked to our, our customers in public and, and private, you know, it's, uh, on, on one term, it's or on one hand, it's been the challenges with hiring, retaining, retaining, and reskilling workers. Uh, other another view is that it's been around worker safety and health and well-being, especially highlighted during the pandemic. But what I want to focus on is <clears throat> really how this I'll call it our disrupted workforce really threatens security and privacy. And we see some major forces, a few I'm going to touch on that are really changing the workforce and. You know, the first we've talked about today, uh, Anthony, Jonathan, and Ray have all touched on it, and it's it's people working remotely more than ever before. And I, I, I've heard the term that some are calling it the largest teleworking experiment in history. Uh, and some interesting statistic: in, NPR stated states that about half the U.S. workers are remote now, compared to about 10% pre-pandemic. And our, our our partners North Canada they grew from 7% to 52%. That, that's a massive shift. Um, and it's not just the number of remote workers, it's the speed at which people were forced to leave their workforce or workplace. I think most of us, that transition happened over maybe a one or two week period, but, but for some, it, it changed literally overnight, for, so, such as NASA. Uh, I'm told they had to leave their building in 24 to 48 hours. Um, me, I've been working from home for nine years, so I had a little bit of, of a, a luxury of, of getting prepared. But, uh, you know, this creates risk. And, um, one example that, that's been talked about, I think Jonathan hit on it, was um, in Ray as well. But but there's also a recent study on the differences in security between corporate network and work from home networks. And uh, one interesting one, an interesting one, found that remote environments 
uh, are three times more likely than corporate networks to have at least one family of malware. And they're seven times more likely to have at least five distinct families of malware, such as viruses, trojans, worms, ransomware. Uh, and it also increases the, the insider threat that by workers who currently have or maybe previously had authorized access to systems and, and that need has changed. And, and some may, uh, you know, unintentionally misuse resources, mishandle sensitive data, unknowingly violate acceptable use policies, or you get those disgruntled employees and that, that has escalated during COVID that may intentionally do harm, maybe stealing company data or damaging systems. Uh, and then another is phishing. Uh, you know, while it's not new, uh, what's new is the context of the pandemic that the bad guys have really used to escalate their activities. Um, just a, a, a scary statistic, according to Google in January of this year, there were about 150,000 active phishing websites. But by May, that number had jumped to over 840,000. So, you know, as, as yeah, yeah, tremendous, like a 500% increase. So, you know, as dramatic as this transition was, uh, it's also fundamentally changing. And I think Ray talked about this, what work gets done and how it's being accomplished, which is creating a revolving door. Anthony talked about the gig economy. That, that's just increasing. Uh, what's also increasing are third parties and fourth parties and fifth parties. Uh, you know, today it's, it's really interesting. Many people are performing jobs they, they never would have imagined. For, for example, employees at uh, apparel companies are producing protective masks and hospital gowns and automakers have retooled their production lines to produce medical equipment. And large banks and financial institutions have temporarily converted thousands of employees to customer facing roles. And then not to mention telehealth, uh, you know, I've had several appointments myself and I love them by the way, but you know, doctors and medical professionals are, are now virtually crossing state and regional lines to care for sick patients. In fact, RSA helped one of our customers, a large pediatric hospital uh, provide licensure and credentialing for about 1500 out of state physicians so they could treat patients across state lines. So it's not just where people work or, or who's doing the job, but it's, it's also how it's being performed. Uh, Ray talked about kind of deconstructing jobs into different tasks and projects uh, that are matched with people, you know, depending on their skills, availability, that, that sort of thing. But we're also seeing just a tremendous boost in cloud computing. Uh, we, 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 somebody talked, Ray, uh, Tom, I think you talked about Zoom earlier uh, as a way of doing business. Back in December, they reported having about 10 million users a day logging into their cloud-based apps. Uh, by March, they reported that number to be uh, close to 200 million a day. Um, and, and, you know, most organizations have uh, just, just some resources in the cloud. And here's where some risks come in. There's limited vi visibility into what those users are, sometimes those devices, what workers are doing. Uh, and a recent study from the Cloud Security Alliance said 80% of those security professionals they surveyed reported a real lack of visibility into their cloud estate and, and that being a, a real threat. And then just the last one I'll say is, is we're also seeing a surge in automation technologies. In fact, according to Gartner, yeah. half of healthcare uh, providers will invest in uh, RBA, RPA, robotic process automation in the next three years. And that's a huge jump from the 5% that, that does it today. So this internet of medical things, and then, you know, think of your own inter internet of things, you know, expands the security perimeter. And um, other industries are likely going to see an increase in these non-human workers too, as I think everybody's trying to improve workforce resiliency uh, reduce costs and increase productivity, enhance the, the customer and the employee experience, especially using artificial t intelligence and machine learning. So, you know, lots going on. These are just a few of the really dramatic changes today that, that we see that are increasing security and privacy risk. So back to you, Tom. Oh, you brought up so many interesting points. Once again, I can only cover maybe one or two just as a follow-up. Do you see like, uh, I look at like mobile devices, it took a little while before uh, the bad guys started looking at that as a viable uh, hacker threat. And then once they got it there, they realized, wow, we can get everything, um, the, the, the 
any anything on anybody on there. And I, you know, the tel telemedicine. I was involved with a pilot like seven years ago. Everybody thought it would never happen, and now here we are. But if my phone's hacked, I'm HIPAA. Uh, you know, you can have some leverage on somebody that you know they have some kind of, uh, or their kid, even worse. You know, somebody somebody in yeah. your family has some 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 very personal information get leaked. It seems like the threat vector is just ten times bigger now than it was maybe before pandemic. Almost, you know, it's it's really expanded. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say the threat vector is 24/7, and there's there there I think there are no borders anymore because you mentioned one you know in in point device there are uh, the IoT and the IO, uh, Internet of Medical Things you know think of those 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 devices and you now you throw work at home and people using their their own devices at home and and you know you've got networks that aren't aren't secured and and personal uh, you know, devices that are logging in through those networks. It's just uh, the, the risk has exponentially grown. Great, great. Uh, okay, uh, we're gonna, we have some questions. We've got some queued up. Uh, we've had some people, audience, uh, please keep them coming. I think we need to maybe look at a, uh, it a do a poll question or two. I know we put a lot of thought. I, they were actually looked really, really good. So Alyssa, if you don't mind, maybe put the first two up. Okay, what are your top risks for remote work? Select all that apply. We'll, we'll give it a minute. We'll see how uh, on the ball the audience is. We'll see, what, we'll see what we can get. And the next question, do we want to get the answer to that first? Alyssa, I forget how we do it. Or do we move to the next question? Oh, wow. Remote work is inefficient. Got a zero. I guess that's a good. That's a. That's a good one. Um, unsecured Wi-Fi. That's a good point. Everybody's working at home, huh? How did? Uh, can I ask a question out of that? Is is that, is that something that's considered when you send all your workers, home? Is uh, I guess using VPN. What would you? We actually had a question earlier in regard to that too. Um, about that. So do we want to talk about that a little bit? Is is how how is your wi your home Wi-Fi, your home environment maybe? Um how big of a an issue is that? Maybe Patrick, if you don't mind starting, I, I'd go ahead or and, and then I'd like to hear from everybody else. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the, the the biggest threats, you know, because it's such an uncontrolled, unknown entity. And um uh, you know, a lot of a lot of companies we work with didn't, uh, you know, had had to kind of create those policies uh, on the fly as they were sending people home, and recommend those those technologies and those security controls. And you know, like Jonathan was talking about the the help desks and establishing their policies and getting them ready to queued up for for the calls that would come and. Uh, you know that, that just ex, ex, so so getting you know good practical technologies uh, and security controls and and just secure hygiene security hygiene around you know those home networks was uh, you know what, what what needed to be done and then managing the vulnerabilities and and the threats that came in on the back end you know through network monitoring and and you know in endpoint monitoring and and that sort of thing. We can talk for an hour about and, that. Yeah, uh, yeah. This this webinar is going by quick. Any of uh, the other government folks, if you can chime in on that, I know Jonathan, you guys have been looking at this We've like, been looking a at while this. ago, and Anthony, I definitely want to hear. Go ahead. Yeah, yep. mobility was our our big uh, force multiplier, and we started noticing. You know, we gave people advice: when you travel find a secured network, make sure it's got WPA2 AES, make sure, make sure, make sure. And users were not equipped to do that. And all they wanted to do was meet their deadline and get their work done. Um, so we started putting some automated controls in place like, hey, I'm on a wide piece of bandwidth here. I'm gonna force you to log into VPN as soon as you connect to that. So 
we'll limit the amount of, of bad things that can happen. And then as we bring you in through the VPN, we'll do some enhanced monitoring of your endpoint and of the connection. And if we notice that you don't have a lot of bandwidth available, we'll lock down that connection and only allow the protocol for VDI and allow you to come in only through VDI. Um, and that was mainly successful. We hit some bumps in the road and we're putting more and more of that in place as we, uh, as we live longer in this uh, enhanced telework mode. But uh, we, th we think we've got some decent solutions. Um, so I'll let Anthony speak. Yeah, my take on it is um, the variety of behaviors and home networks is so wide that, and the makeup in some in homes is hard to control security inside your home, especially yeah. if you have kids and all that. So I just leave that as the wild part of the equation. What we haven't done yet, even though we've all had some kind of teleworking, we haven't really sat down, in my opinion, and designed what mobile networks should look like, right? We've mentioned cloud computing. We've, we've mentioned that people had laptops. I mean, Jonathan, you mentioned that I have a laptop from work, but you know, if I had to redesign this today, no one's getting a laptop unless they absolutely need to have it. So I think there's some things we can do in a design that could minimize some of those risks because trying to, awareness and all that stuff will help the user somewhat, but it's only gonna go so far. I think there's more we can do in the design, a deliberate approach to how we do user networks. And I think that will help us a lot. You know, and if we had been thinking zero trust uh, a few years back when we were implementing this stuff, we probably would not have gone with laptops either. But here we are today and we'll make decisions going forward that will hopefully improve the, the status and, and posture of our users and take some of those decisions out of the user's hands because their calculus is different than mine. I want secure and functional. They want functional. Yeah, yeah. I think Anthony yeah. hit on an important point too. It's a, it's really a process, and there's, you know, what we, what the kind of how we help companies focus, is you know understanding their their steps to this, right? It's a, it's a, it's it's a process, right? But there's, uh, you know, you've got to think about identity assurance and access governance, right? So mon you got to think about your endpoints and and cloud, that's a whole animal, you know, in and of itself. <clears throat> and uh, thinking about insider threats, you know, I alluded to that just a little bit, um, managing those machines, those, that internet of thing, those entitlements and those interactions. And then, you know, we talk a lot about building the human firewall and uh, that's where the culture, you know, comes in and, 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 and the security hygiene and things like that. So I think they both touched on really important points to that, that, the last one, that just, whole infrastructure. The last one I was going to say to wrap it up is we, we, we usually think about the technology and the user. We need to start, kind of start thinking of them as a, a unit. <laughs> um, it would help us a lot. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot there. I, I think we ought to really look at wireless again. Uh, I, I think the NSA and NIAP has some standards for certain things. I like the idea of having ubiquitous wireless connectivity as a service to the government because it's the wild, wild west out there. People are plugging in rogue access points in the office. It's, it's got to be made a whole, a whole, it's got to be looked at all over, the, all, all over, and maybe we can have some comprehensive guidance. I, I, I think that's where we're going to have to go. A little plug to our mobile security group. It's part of our security working group and our mobile group, but it, it's, we have Vincent Sridapan is probably the foremost expert in mobile security and uh, definitely get active in that group if you're concerned about it. Is there anything else? We've had some good questions actually, but is there anything else we need to worry about? I, I know we covered, you know, just printing out classified information or sensitive information. Some of the other things that the security challenges of working from home that may, we may not have not have covered or need, need more color. Does anybody want to have anything else that we might have forgotten? Yeah, patching those endpoints is, uh, has become a challenge and um, having a plan for that was not something that was top of mind until we needed it. Um, so trying to figure out how to do that without killing the VPN was uh, was trial and error, and I think five months into it, we're in a much better place. I won't say perfect, but 
we can we think we can survive a zero right. day and get that patch out quickly now. Right, right. Uh, let's look. So let's do another poll. There's there's some really good questions here that are I wanted to get to. You want to throw that next one up, Alyssa? Greatest insider threat. Wow. Bam. Um, we can get some folks answering that. That'd be great. I don't know what's going to come out of this. Okay. And then question two, I don't know if you can, everybody can see it. What does the human firewall include? Select all that, all that apply. So this doesn't quite look the same as me. I'm on my iPad rather than my laptop. I started fixing computers in 1986 at the Department of Labor. I'm going to have to go back to that and fix my own computer. Okay. Greatest insider threat, rogue employees. Wow. Accidental mistakes, third parties. Interesting, interesting. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll just talk about that. Is there any, any surprise there or um, it's, not a I was going to say, Tom, it's not, I'm oh, sorry, ahead. I was going to say, it's not a, it's not a surprise, um, but third parties, we didn't talk a whole lot about them today, but, but we, mm -hmm. we preach, preach, preach third party risk and governance, not just around, you know, the operational risks, but the, the security risk too. And you've got to look at them almost in the same way you look at your, your own internal employees and technologies, because oftentimes they're accessing the same systems, the same data, and you've got not only third parties, but fourth, fifth, nth parties that just complicate that. And, you know, we see these ecosystems just becoming more and more complex. So that's, that's a big challenge. Sorry, Anthony, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no. You're I to make sure that, yeah. yeah no, I was going to go way out on a limb. <laughs> One of the things I've been really concerned about, first of all, I think the rogue employee makes sense, but I'm taking a different twist at it. I, yeah. I asked the question recently, if we have morale factors at work before we went home, how do you know it doesn't still exist? So one of the things that concern me a lot are people in this environment and their mental state, what makes an employee rogue? I'm kind of concerned about that a little bit, but only time will tell if I'm on the right track or not. It's something we're not really paying attention to, but it's having this effect and I don't know how it's going to come out in the real world to us. <laughs> I think that's very important. And uh, you don't have to have too many to be devastating. We've seen it in our history. And uh, uh, if people, you know, uh, violate the security, it's, it could be devastational to our, to our government and uh, our country. Yeah. Um, so we've learned the lessons really hard before, just with a few employees. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think you're bringing up bringing up a good point. Uh, yeah, so we may, maybe we'll, we want to comment on the other poll. I don't see it anymore. Do we want to put the poll results up? Okay. Uh, human firewall. Uh, you know, I, I think security education. One thing I, I think the Department of State did. I don't know if they still do it. They kind of have a trivia question of the day, and I always thought that was, you know. I work for the University of Central Florida, the Institute for Simulation and Training, just constant training, not just, oh, I got to go to training once a year. It seems like that, that is, that always, I thought that was effective. Um, do, you, do you all want to comment on this? Is there anything surprising or unsurprising? No, I don't think that's surprising at all. Um, we try yeah. and link incentives and motivation to gamify the security education and awareness. Yep it gets a better response. Folks like playing that game and they like beating their friends. Um, so we have, you know, monthly lunch bites, we call them, where folks come down and get a card and do a challenge and uh, hit a couple of related topics like home wireless, home phone configuration. Um, would you click uh, and, you know, let them run through those games and then pick a winner, announce it on a web banner and send them a prize it also helps yeah i really them. like that approach hmm. i think it can 
you know, raise the collective IQ of everybody and make it make it fun. I, I don't know, you know, punitive, you know, I, maybe you need to change something if, if somebody can consistently violate a policy or something. I, I don't know. Uh, no, it's interesting. Okay, well, boy, this this hour is we're actually past the hour. What I'd like to do is is maybe some final thoughts on 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 security and just some of the lessons from COVID. I, I think there's just we could go on for two hours. This panel I feel like we're cutting off early, and it's it's already been an hour. But uh, maybe we'll start off with you, Anthony. Yeah, final thought was another theme I thought about was how we value things, and it's one of those discussions I think we should start having very early. And here's where it goes. Like I've heard someone say, listen, my electricity has gone up. My this has gone up because I'm working from home. It sounds like a complaint and it can be a complaint. But I think if we start having those discussions that we all got to make some adjustments, including companies, including work. Therefore, home may be one to start giving people like, what should your configuration look like? You see it as your investment and not your job paying for it. But I think if we don't have some of those discussions, we're going to end up with that hostage situation like, well, my cost has gone up and you need to pay me. Whereas there are trade-offs happening everywhere and we're not paying attention to them. That's my final thought on it. Great. Interesting. And Jonathan? As Ray said, um, working on the work-life balance is an important thing. Happy employees are employees who can unplug and um, making sure folks are taking their vacation, making sure folks are turning off when they should be turned off, uh, gives them a lot better balance, a lot better focus, and a lot better attitude. So treating people like people, even though they're home and have their equipment with them all the time, don't treat them like a hostage. I love it. And... Uh... Patrick, you get the last word. Oh, the last word. I uh, better make it good. Well, <clears throat> better. it's got to be you know, great. I think, <laughs> it'll be adequate. How about that? So, you know, I, I think uh, something that's really hit home to me is, especially during COVID, like I said, I worked from home and have for a while, but I think this is what, what's hit home for a lot of people is security uh, uh, over my information. It, it's now my job because I have to not only protect the company and their information, but my own information. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed. I mean, from a, you know, a CISO perspective, but also from that person working from home, um, join the club, you know, in, information security and data privacy is a big, a big topic. Um, but here's where risk-based approaches come in um, by focusing on what's imp most important to protect and going after that, making sure those, and governance and those controls are, are in place from a, a you know an organizational standpoint and uh just like i said just understand that it's a it's a process you know to make those systems and data secure but but and, and another point on covid your, your processes to do this have to be as adaptable as those threats that are coming at you um so again it doesn't happen overnight it's a journey but uh but but it's worth fighting in a I'll turn it back over to you. Great, great. Well, thank you all uh, for taking this Thursday afternoon with us. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And thank you, uh, uh, Ray, in, his, in absentia, uh, Jonathan, Anthony, and Patrick. I, I think it's been a great discussion. I've enjoyed doing this. Uh, everybody have a good day, and we'll see you next week. All right. Great. Yeah, Thanks, you. everyone. And last but not least, we are actually uh, – We've got a, another webinar next week that is coming together pretty pretty fast. Uh, we'll probably concentrate on TIC uh, 2.0 and that um, a little bit. But uh, thanks again for your attention, and everybody have a good week and weekend. Take care.